Hello everybody, welcome to our first section of MMP exam one. I've got four videos I want to make for exam one. Uh, this video will cover basic principles of metabolism, the TCA cycle, as well as the electron transport chain. So with metabolism, we're essentially trying to do two things. We're trying to get physical matter components in our body to make proteins, to make DNA, to make storage molecules. Uh, and this is all from what we eat, and we're also trying to make energy, uh, which in most cases is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We can do that a lot of ways. Our primary energy molecule, or at least a molecule that can get us a lot of energy, is our CHOs, our sugars. Uh, typically, that's glucose in its most basic form. Um, however, of course, there are other things in our diet that can also be used for energy, though they're a little less efficient. Uh, there's fats, which are traditionally storage molecules. They're very high energy, though, because they're storage molecules, uh, as well as proteins. And these can take a lot of different paths in our body. So essentially, this is the fed state on the left here, as you can see, meaning we currently have all the resources, essentially, and energy we need in our body. So these are going to go to storage. So a big place we do that is the liver. Uh, if it's uptaken, we can instantly use glucose to begin going through the TCA cycle to produce some energy. Um, glucose can also go to the brain uh, as well as some of our fats. Um, pyruvate can go into the red blood cells, but you can never do the electron transport chain inside of red blood cells uh, since there is no mitochondria there. Um, Muscle also takes up glucose for energy. Muscle doesn't typically release energy ever, though. If you can see in the starve state, uh, the liver may release glucose and other molecules um, when the body is starving, when glucose needs to go to other parts. But since glucose is kind of always needed in the muscles, glucose or glycogen, it's never going to release. And it's sort of the opposite for adipose tissue. Uh, it doesn't need a ton of energy to survive. So triglycerides and fats are always going to leave and go to different parts of the body. Uh, so you can see this one's always leaving and this one's essentially always taking. So that's a really big key there. Uh, that's going to be a recurring theme when we go a little bit more into what transporters bring things in and out of the cells. Um, but yeah, generally most tissues will do a little bit of both, but I think the exceptions there are muscle and fat tissue just to know that ones will essentially only bring in and one will essentially only take out. So there's a little bit of thermodynamics when it comes to metabolism, nothing super complicated, really only the first two laws. Uh, the first is the law of conservation of energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed. It will be stored inside chemical bonds um, and it can be transferred and it can be used. Uh, reactions may lose products as heat, uh, which is essentially an inefficiency in a reaction. You may also see something like this, the symbol delta G. Delta G is essentially the total energy in a reaction, um, and it can show if the system is taking in or bringing in, taking out energy. Uh, if a system is releasing energy, that'll usually be a negative value, and if a system is taking in energy, it'll usually be a positive value. And reactions with this negative are generally favorable. That's due to the second law. Uh, the universe tends towards chaos and entropy and heat. And this free energy is essentially heat that's lost from the reaction. So if a reaction energy, which you will need to know a little bit for the TCA cycle, is negative, that usually means it's more fav favorable and it's releasing heat. So a little bit on basic sugars. Um, and this is um, glycolysis. This is turning sugars into pyruvate. Um, we start with glucose. And there are two enzymes you're going to need to know. These will be tested. There's hexakinase, which is found only in the liver, and there's phosphoglucose isomerase, um, which is found essentially in all other cells besides the liver. Uh, this is sort of the main step. Uh, what we want to get to is we want to get to this molecule down here known as pyruvate. Um, you'll go into some of these other enzymes and substrates when we do the full path of glycolysis but essentially to get to the tca cycle we're just thinking small picture right now and we'll build a little bit more in i believe the second lecture 
Um, this first step here is also very important. Glucose has a very easy time getting through transporters in the body, so that's why we turned it into glucose 6-phosphate. That actually can't escape from cells due to the phosphate group that's added to it, so it's really good when we need to keep glucose in one place to store it in one part of the body. Um, so that's essential. And then also glucose 1-phosphate can escape from cells. That's another essential product that we can use for different processes, or glucose might be phosphorylated in some other reaction. But um, this phosphoglucose mutase is what changes it back and forth between glucose 1-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate. So knowing these two enzymes is pretty important. Um, this one is you're more likely to be asked, but there's definitely a chance you also get asked phosphoglucose mutase as well. Uh, and the reason we make pyruvate is so we can generate energy carrying molecules in the T TCA cycle. So what do we do once we have pyruvate? Pyruvate itself doesn't go into the TCA cycle. It's a substrate of pyruvate called acetyl-CoA. And it's regulated by this complex known as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which is sort of a series of enzymes and proteins that work together to regulate how fast pyruvate is turned into acetyl-CoA. Um, and this is important because this is a big topic in this class in the sense that even with these enzymes pre present, there's a lot of cofactors that will regulate them to determine how fast this system's going. So for example, um, if this system uh, has a lot of energy right now, um, or I rather I should say a lack of energy in this case, uh, so a distinction between ATP and ADP that I can make on this slide while I'm talking about it is ATP is a higher energy carrying molecule than ADP. So think of ATP as kind of the charged form of ADP and ADP as kind of the uncharged form of ATP. So when we look at ADP right here, we can see that if there's a lot of it, this complex goes does not want to go from active to inactive which kind of makes sense right if we have low energy we would want this complex to be on because this complex alone takes energy um or not so much energy but resources in the form of pyruvate and coacetyl thiol coash for short um and it's same here if we have a lot of pyruvate a lot of our substrate meaning we do have resources to burn uh, we might as well keep this complex on. However, if we have a lot of the product as well as this energy product, NADH and acetyl-CoA, which is the actual molecule that ends up going into the TCA cycle, and this is an energy carrying molecule produced by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, it kind of shows maybe the system's working a little too hard or it's working overtime. Uh, and we can turn that off because we don't want to burn through our resources too much because pyruvate isn't only used in the system, it's also used in other systems. So depleting it all here isn't always the best idea for the body and the body will regulate that. Same here, if the complex is inactive, uh, this phosphatase enzyme will increase calcium, which will reactivate the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, causing this reaction to happen more. As you can see with this reaction as well, as it's not just one molecule going in, you have this cofactor right here, uh, pyruvate and coash kind of meld to turn into acetyl-CoA, carbon dioxide is released, and then this NAD plus is actually charged. So when it's in this plus state, think of it like ATP and ADP. NADH is the charged form, and NAD plus is the uncharged form. Uh, and a simple way to remember this is kind of the more molecules generally are on, or the more yeah, molecules, I'll, I'll stick with that, are on an energy carrying molecule, in this case a phosphate on both of these. This is a triphosphate, this is a diphosphate. The more energy they have, the more carriers they have. In this case, it's a hydrogen. So the more hydrogens this molecule has, the more energy it essentially has to give up. And so this is the TCA cycle. There's a lot you need to remember for this for this class. Um, this is probably the most heavy memorization portion of this class, uh, and the reason for that is actually pretty important. A lot of these substrates come back not only in the TCA cycle, but they're also used other ways. So you'll see citrate a lot, you'll see alpha-ketoglutarate a lot, you'll see malate and oxaloacetate a lot. 
some of these ones like fumarate you see a little bit less but knowing these and knowing these enzymes is essential um there are five things dr robson essentially wants you to know for this section he wants you to know the eight carboxylic acids uh, molecules in this so everything in red uh he wants you to know the enzymes that convert them and these reactions also this is a cycle these can actually go back and forth so these are reversible reactions um he wants you to know the free energy. So that's that delta G we were talking about before. So you can see some of these have a positive reaction, meaning they take in heat. They're a little less favorable. But some of these release a lot of energy. Like this one down here is the highest energy reaction in this entire system. So that's pretty important to remember. He wants you to know some of the substrates that are like co-substrates in this case. For example, an NAD plus is charged in isocitrate dehydrogenase to NADH. Uh, and a CO2 is actually released. This loses a carbon and it releases energy as well. So how should you remember this? Because uh, this is like a lot. This is like eight times five or six. So it's a lot of things to memorize just for one of the, a lecture that only takes a day. And what I would say is look at the things that are different. Look at the things that are important. For example, since aconitase from citrate to isocitrate doesn't release any products, this probably isn't a very important reaction overall um, versus something like alpha ketoglutarate, which is a molecule you're going to see a lot. This charges an energy carrier, releases a carbon, and has the highest energy difference in the entire reaction. Same with this malate acetate, except this has the highest unfavorability of any reaction, uh, which is really important for some processes later. The fact that this is unfavorable. Write that in. Favorable. So even though you will need to know, any of these are fair game, but sections I would focus on more than others are this reaction, this reaction, this reaction, and maybe this reaction between fumarate and malate, just in the sense that there's zero net energy change, no cofactors, and this is like completely reversible, meaning that this kind of just can happen spontaneously. There's no preference either way. Same with this one, except you have this energy carrier FAD2H. Uh, which is used in different parts of the body that can maybe contribute, but they're not the most important thing in the world, so we won't even leave that on there. Uh, some other things that are really super important is, I'm going to even change my pen color for these, you should memorize these, is um, one alpha ketoglutarate being the highest energy reaction. We already touched on that a little bit, um, so I'll circle that in blue. Um, isocitrate dehydrogenase, this enzyme is the rate limiting step of the whole TCA cycle. Uh, I guarantee you'll see that in either your quiz or your exam, so I would really stress remembering that. A little side note, uh, throughout this entire process, uh, you generate like 3 NADH, 1 GTP, assuming you're going in the clockwise direction, so that way, and 2 FAD, 2 H. So things like that are important. You probably won't get asked that specifically, but I would definitely recommend there's a few steps that make NADH. There's this one, there's this one, uh, and there's this one. Know the steps that make NADH. Uh, those are probably the most important area energy carriers for the electron transport chain. So those will most likely be what you ask. GTP is also an energy carrier. Um, it has some roles in the body, but it's not as important as the NADH. Um, and I think... The best way to do this is how I learned this, is I studied in sections. So the first day, I just memorized the order of the tricarboxylic acids. They come pretty easy. Make a mnemonic if you need to. I would recommend starting with citrate and then going all the way around to oxaloacetate. Although since it's a cycle, it doesn't really technically matter where you start. Um, the reason I start here is because this right here is this, where acetyl-CoA is the substrate. So this is where it actually goes into the reaction. So that's pretty important. So a lot of people kind of just start memorizing it at citrate synthase. Then I do enzymes, then I do free energy, and probably the least important is you don't even probably technically need to remember these. Uh, you might get like one multiple choice question. It's like, what name one of these which can produce an NADH? So I would recommend like touching on the substrates, uh, but really these three are what you need to remember. So I hope that cuts down on your studying just a little bit. Um, I also, since I know this diagram is a lot, uh, I'm going to provide a blank one in the description uh, for anybody that wants to fill it in. Um, I was about to say, put it on like um, 
OneNote or print it, however you want to do it. I recommend maybe doing running through this blind um, at least twice, uh, if not maybe a little bit more. Doing it blind really will help. Uh, so yeah, uh, that will be in the description of this video. So now that we've gotten our NADH from the TCA cycle, uh, we're moving on to the electron transport chain, which is located inside the mitochondria. Um, and that's also something else I should mention is the TCA cycle takes part in the mitochondria, whereas glycolysis, all those steps of glucose to go to pyruvate, takes place in the cytoplasm. So that will probably be a question at some point. Um, the way I like to think about it is the chain adds up to this uh, enzyme, this protein right here called ATP synthase. And the way I like to think about it is it spins sort of like a water wheel. So it takes in an, an ADP, uh, which if you remember is sort of like the uncharged version of ATP and a phosphate, which is the thing that can charge it to ATP. And it sort of spins around. Um, and the way it spins is in, if it's like a water wheel, essentially protons are the water or the fluid moving it in this case, uh, in our analogy. And it takes 12 protons to do one full spin and an ATP is produced for every four protons, meaning um, essentially we will make three ATP in a full rotation, which is pretty good. ATP is a pretty handy molecule. Uh, it can power a lot of um, things. So from just 12 protons from NADH, that's a pretty big upswing in energy. And that's kind of the point of the electron transport chain is we take these weak energy carriers and we make them into something that can do a lot more work. Um, as far as the structure goes of the um, ATCP synthase, you don't usually need to know structures too in-depth in this class. Know that the part that locks in the ATP, though, has alpha and beta subunits. Uh, this part down here is a GABA subunit, and then you also have C subunits, which are kind of, think of it almost like a chamber and like a revolver. Uh, a proton will go into each one of those, and that's kind of how it'll spin. So, essentially, um, the way we're making energy is we're using the molecules over here, our energy NADHs, uh, as well as random protons, and we're trying to get them across this barrier. Uh, we're creating an electrochemical gradient, and this is called the chemiosmotic hypothesis. And essentially, once we've put, it's 10 in this diagram, but 12 total protons across, we're able to put that back in the chamber of the revolver. We have our alpha beta subunits, and it can make ATP. Um, and it's through these four enzymes, or really three, there's four cytochrome enzymes that do this. However, the second one isn't technically used in the process. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But through these four, we're able to essentially charge up all these protons for ATP synthase, which can make us ATP for the body. Let's talk a little bit more about the electron transport chain. Uh, like I mentioned before, complex two isn't really part of the ETC, so we don't need to worry about that. So there's really only three things we need to remember. And the first step is complex one or NADH reductase. So you can see here, we take one of our NADH molecules. Uh, there's actually an iron uh, ion molecule in here, which will allow this to be a favorable reaction, uh, which allows four protons total to cross this complex and get into the inner membrane space of our mitochondria, uh, which is the favorable side. Because as you can remember, the C proteins are on this side of ATP synthase. And then down here we have our alpha beta subunits. So the what essentially happens next is after NADH works in complex one is site C uh, is released from complex three. Um, there's a whole cascade of coenzymes here uh, molecules. They're not incredibly important. Another iron molecule right here. But the important thing is, is this protein that's part of complex three detaches and it can activate complex four. Uh, kind of the interesting thing on complex four that you might be tested on is this is actually a copper ion in here, uh, which allows the um, change in state of the oxygen molecule. It's one of the few places copper is used in our body. It's why it's an essential part of our diet. So just kind of interesting right there. Um, but what we can do is we can turn oxygen uh, with hydrogens into water molecules. Uh, so that's really impressive. And that's actually what allows us to, and that's why we breathe oxygen, is it's this step going through this reaction is what produces water. 
Um, and then with all that, we are able to produce an ATP from ADP. Um, and because we need this oxygen right here, the electron transport chain isn't able to work without oxygen. Um, this is part of oxidative um, metabolism of sugars. Uh, there's a non-oxidative part we will talk about a little bit later, but this is essentially the reason why you need to breathe air is uh, essentially solely for this. And the red blood cells are what transport the oxygen to your cells. Um, something else to note is that this is another process that's regulated. When um, ATP is high, we need a little less energy. So this process is a little less favorable just because there's a lot floating around, even though this step is never reversible. I do want to stress that the electron transport chain is not reversible. Uh, but when ADP is high and energy is low, this is much more favorable, especially if there's phosphate ions around, because there's constantly more fuel to essentially push the system forward. So to finish up our lesson today, uh, we're going to talk about uncoupling. And that's essentially when these protons we worked so hard to get uh, in the inner membrane space leak back without using the um, ATP synthase. Because as you remember, they're kind of like the water for our water wheel. This is essentially like if water just passed the river and didn't even pass through the water wheel, there would be no point. There would be no energy. Um, and this is really bad. There's some proteins that can do this. Um, that's one way. There's also chemical mediators. Uh, the one you'll probably be asked about is the DNP. Just know that in some way they alter ATP synthase or the other components of the membrane, which can kind of allow protons just to leak back through, meaning we can't make any energy because there's nothing to power ATP synthase. So those are really bad. That kind of takes away the entire point of the electron transport chain. Something else uh, that can happen is about, I think it's 5% of the time or so, um, we can produce something called an oxygen super radical uh, from coenzyme Q in the electron transport chain. Uh, and as you can see here, that's an O2 minus. This is a radical. Radicals are bad uh, in the sense that they can react with protein and DNA. And it's especially bad when they interact with DNA because this can cause changes in your genetic code um, which can lead to mutations and all sorts of bad things. Proteins aren't as bad, but obviously not ideal if you have a lot of proteins that are getting damaged. Um, even though it's not like a genetic change that will be permanent, this can still mess up your processes that you currently have going on in your cells. So that's far from ideal. And the way we do deal with this is we have a few ways. Um, we have superoxide dismutase. Uh, that's an enzyme that goes into these essentially pockets in your cell. It's called peroxisomes, um, which essentially will degrade H2O2 uh, because that's essentially what this uh, superoxide will eventually react to become is uh, H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide. Um, and there's another way we also do this called the glutathione system. You'll learn more about this in pharmacy school. Um, you'll learn that it's actually what detoxifies acetaminophen or Tylenol in your body as well. Uh, when that toxifies. Um, and this also has the ability to reduce H2O2 into water. So that's pretty nice. Um, there's also some natural molecules that can do it. Uh, I think vitamin E, vitamin C, even like melatonin can do it. Um, but your primary ways you're going to do it are this superoxide dismutase as well as glutathione. Uh, and with that, thank you so much for viewing and good luck on your quiz or exam.